Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, everyone who came here on the late Friday. I would also uh, I would like to have special thanks for my committee members. Um, and um, so today I'm presenting to you my research that I've been working on for the last two years and a half in the math department um, under the supervision of Dr. Uh, Jürgen Simanzik. Uh, my field is uh, in statistical computing and visualization. So whatever you're going to see here, you won't see any numbers here. What we are seeing here is visualization and a lot of programming. But of course, it's going to be very, like, uh, very clear to everyone, hopefully. Uh, the topic or the title for the presentation is Visual Data Mining Techniques for Functional Actigraphy Data and Object-Oriented Approach in R. Now, the, the title might be vague a little bit at the beginning, but in few slides, everything should be very clear. Um, during the time of this presentation, what, uh, what, we're, what I'm going to do, first I'll introduce the topic, and I'll tell you the motivation behind our work. After that, there are three, three goals that we had in mind at the beginning uh, when we started our research, uh, and then uh, these are the three goals that we achieved right now, and I'm going to ex uh, explain a little bit about each goal here. And finally, I'm going to uh, conclude with a with discussion uh, of what we've done and what we were, will be doing uh, in, in future. Um, first of all, what do you see here? Like what this picture represents to you, or what do you, what do you think of this picture? Sheep. Counting sheep? Counting sheep, right? When do you usually count sheep? When you want to sleep and you can't sleep, right? So sometimes, you know, you count sheep, you count until 10 and then you end up sleeping. Sometimes you keep counting and you probably reach 1,000 and you're still awake, right? And then on the second day, what happens, you wake up and you probably be in a grumpy mood and then you go to your work and then you end up sleeping. I have, sometimes I do the, you know, this happens to me, right? But if this thing happens every time and every night, you know, then there's a problem. And this problem, in order to add this problem, we have to, you know, probably go to a doctor, a medical doctor. And when you go to the medical doctor, the, uh, you know, the doctor has two options. The first option would be like to, uh, in order to, uh, to observe how you are doing during the night, he or she will have to go with you to, to your house and see how you sleep, how it's your sleeping patterns or how you, you're doing your activity during the day and probably that's impossible. The second option would be to ask you to come to a sleeping center, right? Uh, and then probably for one night or two nights and then they observe your activity during the night and then collect data of your activity and then they ask you to go home. This might be a bit expensive, right? Now the third option here that, you know, what we are going to talk mainly about in this, in this presentation is what we call actigraphy. Actigraphy is, a, is an emer emerging technology that helps in collecting data about patients, about the activity of the patients. So what, the, what happens, I'm going to directly show you what's actigraphy. What happens, the medical doctor, you go to the medical doctor, he will ask you to wear a certain device around your wrist, so it's a watch-like device. This device has a sensor that collects data about your activity every 15 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute. It depends how you do this or how you put the settings of your uh, uh, of the device, okay, and he or she will ask you to go home, do whatever you want, sleep, uh, take shower, do whatever you want, it doesn't matter, keep this around your, your, your wrist, and after maybe a week or two weeks, this, uh, the, you will go back to the, do to, the, to the doctor and he will take it, plug it to the computer, download the data, and then try to analyze your data, and in that way, so you don't have to, uh, to, uh, to go to a sleep center or to do anything. So what we are interested in, in this presentation, uh, or before, uh, this is what, you know, uh, what human actigraphy can do for us. Actigraphy, remember, actigraphy is uh, re related to the actigraph. It comes from the name of the device of the actigraph. So what this could do for us, it could help uh, in detecting sleeping patterns such as insomnia or any kind of sleeping disorders. It could also help in assessing less, uh, uh, rest, uh, restless leg syndrome. 
Uh, it could also help in tracking reco recovery after heart attacks. So, for example, you know, if there's patients who have heart attacks and then you, the, the doctors would like to observe how they are doing after a certain operation or certain surgery, all they have to do is to, to make them wear an, uh, uh, an actigraph. The same thing for HIV patient before the medicine and after the medicine, what's happening. Also, uh, this, this device could, uh, could help in assessing depression among patients. And actually, what we are doing, mainly the data that we collected for our uh, for our uh, uh, research, is related to depression levels of uh, different patients. We'll talk uh, more about the data in a bit. Our target is uh, to be able to visualize this kind of data. Now, in any kind of statistical analysis, here most of us are scientists or journalists or uh, statisticians. We collect data, right? And then after you collect data, you try to analyze the data. But before you try to analyze the data, what would be the first step you do? What do you usually do before? You would like to look at the data, right? You would like to discover certain patterns on your data before trying to do any statistical analysis. This means that we have to visualize the data. This is what we call exploratory data analysis. Now, for the actigraphy data, what has been done so far is these two plots. These two kinds of plots are the main visualizations for this kind of data. Um, they are useful plots, but they, are not, they don't tell a lot for us. This plot here, on this plot on the left-hand side, what it tells us, uh, first of all, on the x-axis, you can see that this is a timeline that goes from 12 p.m. Uh, to 12 p.m. on the second day. And then it represents the, activi the activity level of patients, uh, of the same patient, actually. We are talking here about only one patient. The activity level of one patient over several days. This is from 12 p.m. up to 12 p.m. The spikes here, the, bl the black spikes, represent the activity level of that patient at a certain period of time. You notice here probably that there's an empty part. What do you think this empty part represents? Sleep. Sleep. When he's sleeping or she's sleeping, there's not much activity. Maybe here probably there's some activity. Probably he went to, to the restroom or something. But, uh, you know, uh, the, this, this, this tells you, the, uh, this, this kind of plot could tell you about the variability among... Uh, Different days, how the patient is doing during different days, you can notice that on this day, there's a lot of activity compared to probably this day or to, to that day. Maybe on this day, the, the patient has taken off his actigraph, and that's why there's, no, there's not much data here. Um, now, this is what we can get from this kind of plot. It's only, again, for one patient. If you want to compare many patients, you can look at if frequency histograms, such as in, uh, in, in this plot here. Now, our target... Uh, is to be able to vi visualize such kind of data and, and doing better, visual, uh, better visualizations. To do that, what we thought, we thought that, you know, this kind of actigraphy data, since we are collecting it every 15 seconds and sometimes every one minute, this means that we are collecting the data almost continuously over, the, uh, over time, right? So we can treat this kind of data as functional data. We can, we can think of the data, instead of looking at the data as individual points, Right at each minute what's happening, we can look at each day what's happening and try to look at each day and consider each day as an observation. And this is what we call functional uh, data analysis. Um, <clears throat> now, we had, again, as we said, we had three goals in our mind. The first goal is to be able to visualize this kind of data. Now, imagine that you want to, to hypothesize, suppose that you have like, uh, 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 you know, a doctor wants to come up with a certain hypothesis trying to relate depression levels to actigraphy levels or to activity levels. In order to do that, to visualize that, the only way to do it is to plot all of the patients that they have, the, the data of these patients, on one plot. This is a raw data plot for 55 patients and each patient has four days of data. Trying to look at this kind of graph here, can you, can you, can you discover anything from this kind of plot? Again, this is going from 12 a.m. up to 12 a.m. Now, you might see that, you know, there is, um, 
trying to be fancy here, but it's not working. <laughs> we have a smart board here. Uh, so there is kind of uh, you know a gap here which represents the night. You know there is low activity during the, the uh, during the night, but this is all what we can do. But we can see different clusters of data. We can see different clusters of patients regarding, for example, uh, different depression levels or males versus females or different age groups. So this was our first goal, is to develop new visualization tools for actigraphy data. The second goal is, you know, after we develop these tools, we, 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 we used R. R is the programming language, or it's a programming environment for statisticians that we use in order to do analysis, produce visualizations, etc. When we, when, uh, when we did our coding, remember this number here. What, this number is a huge. Do you know what this number represents? It's, it's the number of lines of code that we wrote for our visualization. So we wrote 6,000 lines of code. Now, I'm not bragging about this number here, but what's, what's, uh, what about this number is that in order to be able to, uh, to manage this amount of code, right, you have to, have to follow a certain software engineering strategy in order to be able to reuse this code later on. Imagine, like, you know, some... I don't want to say someone else is going to use my code. Imagine me trying to use this code in maybe one week from now. I would be very lost doing that. How about if we want, like if we are trying to give these to doctors and try to use that, they, they are going to be also um, uh, lost with this number of code. So what we wanted to do is to integrate this amount of code into an R package that could be reused, but the, the only difference is, or the, the main difference here between this R package and different R packages is that it, it followed the object-oriented model design. We'll talk about this in detail, what's object-oriented uh, model design. And the third one is even after we manage our, our code and we follow a certain software engineering, we still have to run code, right? We still have to do that. Try to, like, do you, you know, the, uh, the people who are interested in this kind of software are mainly from the medical field. Right? And probably they wouldn't like to run code, they wouldn't like to install R, they wouldn't want to do all of these things. We all like to click, right? And so instead of doing that, we decided to develop a user-friendly web interface for this package, what we call this package is Activist or Actigraphy Visualization, okay? <coughs> so we had three goals, visualization tools, goal number two, integration into an R package using object-oriented design, and the third goal, was developing a user-friendly interface, web interface for this package. Now, this uh, this was uh, this was like a general overview of our uh, of this talk here. Next, I'm gonna uh, start talking about each each goal in in uh, in particular. So we start with goal number one: developing uh, developing new visualization tools of actigraphy data. As we said that you know we could all we could visualize either one patient. You know we would try to visualize one patient. Or if we want to do certain hypothesis or to come up with a hypothesis, then we were going to look at a random sample probably or a big sample in order to be able to come up with hypothesis. Now from now on, I'm going to refer to one patient as a sample or it's, it's a case here. Uh, our friend Carly. Is Carly here? Yep. Carly is here. She's the one responsible for the food. <laughs> and then if, if when we're looking at multiple patients, then we're going to think of Carly and, you know, her friends. First of all, let's look at one patient or one Carly. So, so we, what we did, I gave Carly an actigraph. This is a, this is not true, but this is this is real data. Though. But think of this: I gave Carly an actigraph. She wore it for uh, seven days, and then I got the actigraph back and downloaded the data, and then we tried to see with our visualizations here what happens to uh, what's happening with Carly. We have six kinds of visualizations. Again, each, each of these represents the time, uh, the x-axis represents time from 12 a.m. to 12 a.m. And the y-axis represents how much activity Carly has accumulated at a certain period of time. The top left, uh, the top left uh, graph represents the raw data, just like individual data, without, treating, uh, with, uh, without looking at functional data here. Now, again, looking at this graph, what we have here, we looked at only four days of Carly's data. Day three, four, five, and six, and the red line here represents the average of Carly's uh, uh, activity, activity data during the four days. Looking at this graph, you know, it could tell us probably that you know she's sleeping well during the night, and during during the day she has some activity, right? But this graph wouldn't tell us what's happening in each day. 
right? So, for example, you know, we can see that there's some higher activities at different days, but does this mean that there's some outliers, there's special uh, activity that Kwame is doing during a certain period of time? In order to do that, and since we decided to look at the actigraphy data and think of it as uh, functional data, we smoothed our, our uh, data here. So instead of looking at, again, minutely data, we smoothed every day, and then we have four observations instead of whatever number of observations here we have. Okay, uh, this is probably like 14, 40 times 4, and then you can do the calculations for that. But instead we're looking at four observations here. Notice that there's an outlier day here, and this would be day number 6. So on that day, Carly wasn't very active during the day, and neither during the night. So it might be an outlier, or, you know, Carly might have shifted her activity between day and night, or well, in order to do that, we have to do further plotting. Now, in addition to that, since we are treating, we are looking at functional data, we can look, so if we have functions, right, we can do derivatives, first derivative and second derivative. In calculus, what we learned about the first derivative is what the velocity, right? And second derivative represents acceleration. So these two plots, this is the first derivative and the second de derivative of these functions. This one would tell us, uh, uh, would tell us about when the <coughs> when Carly's data is increasing or activity is increasing and when she when it is decreasing. If you want to see how fast this is happening, you look at the acceleration plot here again. Uh, at each point you can see uh, wh what's happening. Now remember that we were looking and trying to see if this is an outlier here. We can, we can double check with, what, with these two plots that we have here. These are cumulative sums plot. What we're doing, uh, we're looking at each minute and then the second, uh, like, the second observation would be the previous observations plus that observation. So we are <coughs> accumulating all of the uh, observations through the time. And then at the very end, this point here represents the amount of activity that Carly has accumulated through the whole day. Again, you can see still that this day number six is a, a kind of like lower compared to the other data. So indeed, we can think of this, this day as an outlier. This is sorted cumulative sum if you want to have another look uh, for the cumulative sums plot. All right, so here we, we have six visualization techniques for only one, one, one patient. If you want to, think, to look at well, multiple patients, <coughs> and when we say multiple patients, uh, you know, in actigraphy, we, uh, you know, we, look, we, we would look at 750 patients or maybe 1,000 patients. That's how, how big our, uh, uh, our sample would be. We introduced four new visualization techniques to be able to do that and look at different clusters in, uh, in our data. The first one would be density-based plots, uh, data enveloping techniques, data summing techniques, and multivariate time series uh, plot. So what each one represents, so what I'm going to do here, first uh, I'll introduce the data set that we used, and then after that I'm going to show you just pure graphics and explain these plots in, uh, in graphs. Uh, to be able to check if our you know, techniques are working or not, we collected data. We actually, what we did, we collaborated with researchers uh, from the sleep center at the uh, University of Washington in San Luis. And then uh, we, there was 55 uh, patient, volunteer patients. We collected two types of data, actigraphy level data using the actigraph. And at the same time, in order to be able to see how different patients, uh, uh, you know, to, to see if there's, our plot could do clustering, we looked at different depression levels of these patients. What we did, we had a survey and we asked them questions. And, and then at the very end, we assessed their depression level. Uh, the patient demographics here, we had 17 males and 38 females. Remember that this is not a random sample, so whatever we are saying here, we're not generalizing, we're just to strict to this kind of sample. We had five depression levels, uh, no depression, mild depression, moderate depression, uh, 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 severe depression, etc. Now, <coughs> the first type of visualization would be the density-based plot. In order to, uh, to see what's happening here, first of all, the density, in density-based plots, we are using color shading techniques in order to see, like, uh, the, to, to, to check how much uh, the activity we have, or how our observation would be plotted on these, on these graphs. So we're not plotting points here, we're not smoothing, we're not using any of the smoothing techniques in statistics. 
or what we're doing with you, we're using color shading techniques. We have five levels of depression. Level zero is no depression, level four is the highest depression level. If from these plots again, what you can see that, again, we, we are on each plot we are plotting more than one patient. Like for example, for this one we had 15 patients at zero depression level. And then we can see that they have normal activity during the day, during the day and during the night for the, the, four, the first four depression levels. But the last one here, you can notice that this person, or this, uh, not just this person, this group of people who have very high depression levels, they are, you know, active during the night, at the same time active during the day. Right? So these people are always active. So that's what our data showed to us here. This was the, second, the first technique. The second technique uh, is what we call data, data enveloping. Data enveloping is a very simple technique, or it, it's a very simple uh, procedure. What we're doing is um, we looked at categories, or we subsetted our data set into categories. For example, we could look at different depression categories, or what we're doing here, we're looking at males versus females. So we subsetted our data set into males and females. And then uh, what we did, we, uh, we looked at, um, we draw bands around these classes, and then what, uh, after that, we filled this with color to see what to see, to see each category what's uh, in each category what's happening. Uh, we could look from minimum observation. We could draw bands from minimum observations to maximum observations, or we can do even subsets or lower the bandwidth of e of each uh, of each band to probably 40 to 60 percentile, or you know 25th to 75th percentile, etc. On the first graph here, again, remember we're looking at two classes, males versus females. We can do that also for depression levels. Um, we can, uh, for the females is in, uh, supposedly this is in blue, but according to this, this is probably what? Uh, black? So we have black versus, uh, black versus red. Red is males, black is females. Uh, we can see that there's spikes here. Probably this would be some outliers here. Uh, but again, remember what we're doing, we're looking from minimum to maximum observation. Doing that is not going to reveal anything. What we can do, we can lower the bandwidth of each, uh, of each uh, envelope. And here, when we looked at the 40 to 60 percentile observations, we can see that, you know, uh, they have very low activity during the night and higher activity during the day. Now, when you try to compare males versus females, which one you think has higher activity here? Remember that the red is females, black is males. Red is more, it's kind of like a little bit more active compared to males. So females are more active than males. Now, this reveals some information to us, but still we can see that there's spikes here, right? We don't like spikes, we want to have a prettier graph, but again, not just prettier graph. We want to have prettier graph, but revealing information, more information to us. What we can do, we can combine this technique with another technique, what we call data summing technique. The data summing is in, uh, what, uh, what you do, you sum many observations into one observation. So you can think of 10 observations, sum all of them together, aggregate all of them and, uh, into one observation, and then, uh, and then plot this observation on, uh, on the graph. We again, we are looking at minimum to maximum envelopes and uh, 40 to 60 percentile envelope. It's still the same thing, we didn't change anything, but you would probably notice that there's a difference between this and that. There's less spikes, right? It's more smooth here. And uh, again, this still re putting that, uh, showing us that there's an outlier here, it's not revealing a lot. When we, uh, uh, when we had a, a smaller envelope, we can still uh, see that, you know, what, what do you think here is, uh, is more active? Who's more active, males or females? Okay, so, <laughs> again, here, if, uh, if you want to have a smoother, even smoother plot, you don't, want, you don't like to have these angles, what you can do is sum, increase the summing, right? Instead of summing every 10 minutes, you could sum every 20 minutes or every 30 minutes. And this would lead to more smoothly, smooth, or to, a smooth, to smoother plots. The last plot for, multi, uh, for, uh, for multiple patients, it's called the multivariate time series plot. Um, this plot is, is, reveals a lot. Usually in traditional time series, who works in time series here? 
Perfect. So in traditional time series, if you want to try to uh, to compare many time series together, what you usually do, you plot these time series and you try to put them all of them together on top of each other on one page probably. How many time series you would end up having on one page? 120. 120? You are Superman. <laughs> Don't believe him. It's like five or six. <laughs> It's, pro it's probably 5 or 6, it's not more than that, right? Otherwise, if you want to plot the 120, you wouldn't see anything. But here, uh, maybe you would, I don't know. <laughs> you should teach me, though. Uh, here, what we have, we have 55 time series, and we can even increase that. Where are these 55 time series? If you t uh, um, first of all, let me just tell you how this plot is divided. We have three plots in one plot. This is an image plot here, where there's a lot of colors. This is a medium plot here. It could be substituted with any of the other techniques that we introduced earlier. It doesn't have to be this way. It's just a, a parameter that you pass it and then it will change this plot. And here, we are having a box plot for each time series. So whatever, whatever, when we're looking at this, if you notice that there's ticks here, each tick represents one time series. And in, uh, to, to, to see how the, uh, the, the variability in each time series is happening, we used, again, color coding techniques. Uh, here we use three colors, three diverging colors, to, 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 uh, to tell about the uh, uh, different uh, activity levels for each time series. Uh, this is brown, but on my computer it's purple. The brown <laughs> represents the least amount of, uh, of actigraphy. Medium actigraphy would be gray, and the green would be the highest actigraphy, right? Now, in general, if you look at all of this data image here, you would notice that there's a lot of gaps here. There's a lot of purple here. This represents night. This represents day. Now, of course, different patients, for example, if you look at this patient here, there's a lot of purple or brown. This means that there's not a lot, maybe he's dead, I don't know. <laughs> okay, now again, if you want to see, more, to see more about each plot, you would probably look at each box plot for each time series, and you would see how the data varies or ranges from, you know, the minimum to maximum, what's the median, etc., from these box plots. As we said, this could be changed here to any of the other techniques that we had before, so this would reveal more information. Abbas, just yes. to help you... I'll be a timekeeper. So okay. we, 30 minutes that have passed. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've, I'm almost done. Goal number one takes the most amount okay. of time, so don't worry. Okay. <laughs> but Great. anyway, so uh, this thank is you. the multivariate time series plot. Um, what's this? Have, have anyone seen this before? Mm -hmm. Any of Jürgen students? <laughs> so this is the handwriting of Jürgen. This is how me and Jürgen communicate. Well, I should say Dr. Simanzik here, but... Uh, Dr. Simanzik, this is how he communicates with me. I try my best to do that. So this is just to make sure if the committee doesn't want to give me a PhD in statistics, I would like to have a PhD in deciphering Jürgen's hand. Yes, I <laughs> Okay, so that was the first goal. The second goal, after creating these techniques, we said that there's a lot of code involved. To arrange this code or to manage this code, we, will, we put it in one R package, we called it an activist, and we're, gonna, we're planning to publish this in the next month or two on the CRAN website for, for R. Now, oh, wow. This is who Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is the best guy to tell us what's object-oriented programming. He always used terms that, you know, make me love whatever they 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 are they do at Apple. So what Steve Jobs defined he that's how he defined object-oriented programming. He said, object-oriented programming is like the industrial revolution of software. It allows you to avoid creating everything from scratch and increasing the productivity of programmers. Programmers by the order of magnitude or two. Now the best part of it is here. This is similar to what interchangeable parts did for the manufacturing of hard goods. So whatever we're gonna do here, what, like the, the approach, the programming approach we followed, it helps us to uh, use our, or to, uh, to split our systems into pieces and each piece is still functional. It could be used, it could be, so for example, if you want to enhance your sy uh, th this system, to enhance a certain plot in this system, we take that plot or an object, which is the plot, and enhance it and then put it back, the system is still working. Okay? Nothing is connected to each other uh, in, uh, in, in this system. 
Another, I would like you to acknowledge uh, Miss Lopez because she was the one who was helping me a lot during the night to, to do my programming. But, um, so these are the four things that needed in order to, con to, make, to make our... Uh, to, 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 to consider a language or a programming language and object-oriented programming uh, language. We need to have objects, classes, inheritance, and polymorphism. I'm going to go very fast on these topics using my system, how, how the system that we created uh, is happening. This, this here is the whole system we created. It includes 11 classes. So what we're thinking of classes or objects is something from reality. A chair could be a class or an object. Uh, a table could be a chair, a patient, since we are dealing with patient, a plot could be an object. So whatever we have here, so we have different kinds of plot. Each plot is represented as an object or um, in general we call it a class. And then here we have uh, uh, the, uh, the, actigraphy, uh, the actigraphy data and in one other class or one uh, object. The difference between this kind of programming design and the usual programming design that we do in R or maybe in any other functional programming is this, each class or each object enca encapsulates the attributes or it encapsulates the data with the methods that could be applied on this data. All right? Previously we have both separated from each other. This would help us to, for example, later on if we want to continue our work and do analysis of our data, Right? We can take this class here, from here, and put it in the other system, it's going to still work perfectly fine. All right? No need to change anything or to uh, enhance anything. Again, we can, this, this could be expanded to a bigger system or other plots could be added to this system. Uh, in R, in order to, uh, to do object-oriented programming um, <coughs> in R, there's many ways to do it. Uh, but again, each one has its advantages and disadvantages. I'm going to briefly say what's the advantages and disadvantages. We start with the F3 system. It's actually the easiest to use. And to be honest, it's easy because it's not fully object-oriented. The, the second system is the S4 system. They created a better system for object-oriented. They made it more fully object-oriented. But it's not as efficient as the other systems that we have here. When we say efficient, is in computation uh, time and in uh, you know the way you are accessing objects in, from memory or copying instead of copying, you're accessing objects in memory. Uh, there's a uh, few people who collaborate in creating this package called R.OO package. O represents object oriented. It's similar to F3. It extends F3, but it's more efficient than S4 because Usually, when you try to get an object in R, you copy that object from one place to another to access it. That's how it is. Like that's how it's done uh, in in the background. But if you do, if you, you follow such paradigm, you're just using the address of that. So it's it's kind of reduces the amount of time and reduces the efficiency or increasing the efficiency in your system. And finally, R5 system, which is the newest here, it has been since two, like the beginning of 2012. It actually has the advantages of all of the above, and this is the system that we use. Uh, this is a case study. I'm not going into the detail of uh, the code here, but in order to, uh, to plot, for example, for Carly, the case study for, uh, for Carly, we read its data using this object-oriented. This is probably different from what people in R have used. That's what we call object-oriented uh, paradigm. Um, this code would create, of course, this plot, which is the raw data plot for Carly, with the average here is uh, in, in green. All right, I'm not going to go, unless if the committee would like me to go into the details of the code, we can do that after uh, the uh, public defense. That was goal number two. Goal number one was visualizations. Goal number two was putting all of them into an R package using object-oriented design. Goal number three is, which is the fastest goal here, <laughs> not the fastest to implement, but the fastest to, to talk about, uh, goal number three is we, to develop a user-friendly web interface. First of all, what we wanted to do, uh, we looked first uh, in developing a Windows interface. Uh, I started doing that when I was in your class, Dr. Karkaran. Uh, <laughs> do, uh, we, we, this was as a project in your class. And then, uh, since in, uh, doing Windows interface, is we ended up like creating something like this. You know, we can interact with it. But the only disadvantage, well, the, the disadvantage behind this is what? 
Windows. It's Windows. You can't use it on your Mac, or I can't use it on my Mac. That's when I. Uh, that's I was. I was working on that when I had a Windows uh, machine. But um, <laughs> you know, it, it's 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 good. I'm not saying it's not good, but you need to have Windows. It, can, uh, it cannot work on Mac or Linux. A more efficient way would be to develop a web interface. A web interface could be accessed from anywhere. It could be even accessed from your cell phones, right? So, or iPads, or any 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 kind of uh, device you have. Uh, so you upload the data, check, check whatever plot you want to check, and then uh, uh, plot it. Before, before doing a demo, a fast demo here, uh, I'm just like briefly mentioning uh, how the system is designed. What we have, we have a client and a server uh, architecture. So we have two components in our system, a client and a server. The client is the doctor or the person using that system, and the server is the one uh, the computer that's producing your, your, the graphics. So what happens, uh, the client here requests a, uh, a request a, uh, something from the server, a service from the servers, from the server, and the server is going to respond to the client and show, uh, give, it, uh, give it to them uh, uh, on their machine. Uh, to, to go into more details uh, for the design of the system here, this is again with this web application is not simple uh, like HTML web page where you're just presenting data and people are accessing it. If that's the case, then we are just using this level or at this level here. But since we are doing an application or we are accessing R, we have to go all the way down through different layers in order to access the R engine, produce the plot, and send it back. So, um, so what's happening here in, in 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 very simple terms, we have the user interface. The medical doctor uploads the data to the user uh, to, to the to, uh, to the computer, and then the AJAX engine is going to be triggered by a JavaScript uh, JavaScript call that hey the data is here can you go and ask a service from the server the server is in on another machine the this system will uh, encapsulate this kind of data into a format that the the server would understand right it's not going the server is not going to understand any kind of uh, format. Uh, we could use XML or we could use JavaScript uh, object notation or JSON. Um, uh, you know, there are probably other uh, notations that we could use, but JSON would be the best if you're dealing with large amount of files or huge data sets. Okay? Uh, when this happens, uh, when, when the trigger goes to the server, we used an Apache server for, uh, for our system. This Apache server is going to interact with the R engine through a module that we, inter we, we used, which is called the R, Ab R Apache module. And again, remember that the data format was JSON here. JSON is what's understandable by the, uh, by the client and the server. It's a JavaScript language. R is not going to understand JavaScript, so again, we have to uh, translate this message into a format that R would understand, and this is where comes the R JSON uh, format. Now, R gets this uh, data, produces the plots, and then send it back to the to the interface, and then they will show to the uh, to the user. Finally, this is the web demo uh, for our system. All right, so uh, now it's connecting to the to the uh, to the internet. Okay, actually, I'm running my my website on the local host, so the the, uh, the client and the server is on here. So that if you don't see that there's the local host. The web interface is very simple. We try we, we, we wanted to make it very simple for the eye and very very easy for it to, to be used. It's uh, on on the right hand side you will see that there's a, an area where the plot is gonna be shown. On the left hand side this is where the user is gonna interact with the with the system. So uh, it's a three step procedure. It's very simple. You upload your data here you can upload as many files as you want. It doesn't have to be one file. Uh, you know, uh, it's AWC file format. This is what comes from the Actigraph. This is the data that comes from the Actigraph. And then you can also up, uh, upload your depression level uh, scores or whatever, uh, you know, other, other scores you would use for categorization. Uh, you upload that and then automatically this will, uh, you know, it's a, 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 it shows you what, what graph type you, you would like to select here. Uh, since we're dealing with pipe one patient, the system is smart enough to just show you the plots that are for one patient. If we ended up like uploading more than one file, then the system is going to detect that, hey, I, you want to uh, 
you know, uh, visualize multiple patients. But let's think of like, um, you know, we decided probably to use a smooth data plot. And then again, the last step would be to enter the title of the uh, of the graph. Maybe since we are talking about Carly, Carly's plot. And then you can enter the range of the actigraphy data that you want to see, and then you would plot that. Uh, okay, so it went back to the server, produced this graph, and then it, pro it brought it here. Of course, you have the capability of saving it by right-clicking on that graph, and then if you want, you, know, you will be like, oh, I want to change the title of this plot. All you have to do is change it here. You don't have to, uh, to, uh, to upload the data again. And this is the, the idea behind using the AJAX engine, is to be able to do things without reloading the whole page. Change that and then plot again. These things will be fast and then... Um, back so, to, yes. your time is up. Could you briefly summarize? Sure. Code? Whatever Thank you, you say, here you go. <laughs> so what we did, again, the three goals we achieved, developing new visualization techniques in an object-oriented design with a friendly user interface. Finally, what we've, uh, some of these plots, especially when we're dealing with multiple patients, more than 100 patients or 200 patients, they're going to you know, uh, need a lot of time for uh, being processed on your on your machine. Now, especially uh, this this would also take more time if we are using the web. The web is going to have more time because you're sending messages over the web and then bring it back to the to the client. Now, in order to reduce this amount of time, what we were thinking, what we are thinking of, is to start looking at parallel programming and doing our programming in a parallel way, so we can use different clusters or different computers to do the computations and then send it back to the uh, to the user. Uh, we could also, of course, enhance our interface. This was a prototype. You can add more uh, parameters that you can. Uh, you, it's not just the title or the range. You can have the color. You can have uh, different kind of parameters. You could, uh, uh, you know, add to the system. Zooming in, zooming out, etc. This would be very easy to do. And then, uh, of course, these techniques are not just for function for actigraphy data. We thought of actigraphy data as functional data, so this kind of visualization, if you're dealing with functional data, this is perfect for your data sets. And finally, after visualization comes the analysis part. So uh, we want to do actigraphy functional data analysis, and actually we started doing that. We started looking at uh, functional principal component analysis to see you know, uh, what's the source of variation on our data sets, etc. And we ended up publishing in chance uh, this kind of article. We had three publications from this research so far. Uh, we intend to have three more representing each goal here um, uh, from, uh, from uh, this uh, dissertation. Thank you. <laughs>
you mean like the visualization part of it or the analysis part the of analysis it? The analysis part. The analysis. So this is like this is going to be in the future part of it. I'm not very uh, like I didn't go into the details of the analysis part of it. We looked at again as we uh, as I mentioned at the very end, we looked at functional uh, principal components analysis to to be able uh, to see what you know the source of variation of of uh, that's happening in our uh, data sets. But I haven't been an expert in that field yet, so. That would be a future, uh, the, our future direction. On, on, in this dissertation, we're mainly focusing on visualizations and being able to see. So it's, we're just focusing on the first part, the exploratory data analysis, uh, the exploratory, uh, uh, you know, data analysis part where you just look at your data, try to find.